one and we are live good evening and I, I dr dharmanand president and indian rheumatology association along with dr aman sharma secretary welcome you all for the second webinar conducted by indian rheumatology association today we have dr j shah from uh, nih usa who is a physiatrist by training and has a special interest in the field of myofascial pain syndromes and has done a pioneering work in this field and he's an in demand speaker all over the world who conducts workshops and uh, uh, many training sessions all over the world and he's, he's many times i think he most of the time lives in the airplane uh, uh, rather than in uh, us and uh, like the prime minister of uh, uk he's i can call him a son in law of india particularly bangalore his wife is from bangalore and he also had we had a wonderful workshop in indore uh, which was appreciated well by many of our delegates who could make it and when it comes to um, pain and myofascial pain we as rheumatologist apart from being clinical immunologist and specialist in autoimmune diseases also deal with pain on a day to day basis and we have noticed many times that our treatment has done wonderfully well and the patients have no 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 clinical inflammation but sometimes the pains don't go away and we need to know everything about the pain and pain mechanisms to help these patients to 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 alleviate this patient's pain and we all felt in the past that the trigger points are very local and has nothing to do with uh nervous system and uh, now we we have dr jay shah telling us that trigger points also have a, a neural basis a neural inflammation and uh, uh, central sensitization uh, plays a role in myofascial pain and uh, along with uh, the well known fibromyalgia with this few words i wel welcome you again and um, um, I, over to you dr shah okay thank you so much can you hear me yes Wonderful. All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for attending this lecture. Um, I had a wonderful time um, in Indoor uh, last November, and I, I met several um, several of you, and I'm looking forward to giving this talk here and hopefully returning to the next uh, conference. Um, so um, like Dr. Dharmanan said, I'm a physiatrist and I work at the uh, clinical center in the rehabilitation medicine department. I've been here now for 30 years this year. It's the only job I've ever had. So I wanted to um, sort of amplify a little bit on the title. Um, and that is to also try to explore what is really an enigmatic pathophysiology and of this syndrome, and particularly the role of trigger points, look at some of the dynamic clinical manifestations that you see in clinical practice. And then what are some novel strategies, whether it's using electrical stimulation, uh, dry needling, paraspinal needling to optimize uh, patient uh, outcomes. So um, our orientation is really um, one of circumspect. We are trying to understand the underlying mechanisms of myofascial pain and the role the trigger point plays either as a primary cause of muscle pain and dysfunction, or as I will show you via the nervous and immune system as a secondary manifestation. And this fundamental difference will determine the course of the patient because if the trigger point is primary and you treat it, pain should resolve, the dysfunction should improve. But if the trigger point is secondary, even if it's spontaneously active and it's secondary, then merely treating the trigger point will not alleviate the pain or underlying problem. You have to identify what is the cause of it. So no talk about myofascial pain cannot be made without really mentioning the seminal work of Janet Travell and uh, David Simons, who were a fantastic team of a clinician and a, and a researcher. And what they observed by doing thousands of uh, patient observations, um, and they were very keen observers, particularly Dr. Janet Travell, was the role that these trigger points play, and particularly the emphasis on palpation, which is, of course, using your finger to strum the muscle along a taut band and then try to reproduce the patient's symptomatic pain. 
But the other real big advantage of this textbook, which I'm assuming many of you have seen or at least have, is it shows you very clearly the underlying functional anatomy, how to palpate the muscle, um, the referral patterns of some trigger points. And as you can see, trigger points uh, and the lower trapezius can refer pain at some distance away. So this can often create diagnostic confusion. And since the original work of Travell and Simons, we understand more, as I will show you, about the role that the nervous system plays. In particular, the role of persistent nociceptive bombardment coming in from trigger points or from other sources that will cause upregulation of substance P, um, glutamate, and cause more postsynaptic excitation in those neurons um, uh, associated with that particular nociceptive ending. So one of the consequences of this, as you see in your clinical practice, is amplification of the receptive field of pain, which is very distressing. And this is due to, as we discussed, central sensitization. And it's not just to the dorsal horn. It's to the ventral horn, the intermediate horn, and this information can even communicate to the opposite side of the spinal cord. As a result, one of the things that we observe and we do clinically is to do careful examination, not just of the trigger point, but to palpate, for example, the segments that are associated with that area of pain. So in this case, this is a patient with chronic pelvic pain, and you see what I'm doing here is a simple pinch and roll test. The findings are most sensitive paraspinally. So I'm asking the patient, please tell me um, if this hurts, and then I mark those segments because this is an examination of allodynia. One can also use a Wartenberg pinwheel, and you can see the patient react right there. She jumps a little bit because I tell her I'm going to apply a noxious stimulus. Please tell me when you feel it more painful right there. So we often will see overlap between the allodynia and the hyperalgesia, and that is associated with these chronic active myofascial trigger points. So one of the things that we can do treatment-wise is to do paraspinal injections, paraspinal needling. We also use, utilize these handheld devices using microcurrent to help localize these sensitized segments. And then using microcurrent, we can then treat these segments very effectively. And one of the things that we observe um, after treatment, as you will see in a moment here, is a, a, an immediate, almost like a light switch going off, turning off, a decrease in the sensitization. So here you see the examination of hyperalgesia using a simple paperclip, the sharp edge of a paperclip. And the patient's zone of sensitization has decreased markedly. The pain pressure threshold in the original source of pain and the plantar aspect of the foot has gone up, as has the pain threshold in every segment of muscle, uh, myotome, dermatome, et cetera, sclerotome, innervated by that segment, in this case, L5S1. So just to give you some idea. And this is the actual structure that is targeted. It's the, uh, the medial branch of the posterior uh, primary uh, rami. Okay, so <laughs> this is important also. Um, Unfortunately, and still to this day, there are some people who are kind of in this older camp, if you, as I like to call it, um, who think of trigger points as merely nociceptive and involved in acute pain, which they can be, right? And this acute pain can certainly uh, be felt, uh, let's say, in the vastus medialis or rectus femoris, and that can give you pain referral to the knee, right? Um, and from a trigger point there. But the thinking that this is only due to acute pain and that, oh, little tincture of time, little bit of reassurance and the pain will go away. Maybe for acute problems, but we will, as we will discuss, certainly for chronic myofascial pain, that is not the case. And unfortunately, many clinicians are still focused on looking at it as a nociceptive problem primarily and not considering central sensitization. So they look at it as peripheral versus central. And as I will show you, the peripheral affects the central. And so central sensitization, of course, is associated with disuse, depression, disability. The buzzword now more in the literature is central sensitization syndrome. But as I'm going to show you, uh, we see disuse, depression, disability in chronic myofascial pain syndrome as well, and a lot of other things that are typically associated with a more fibromyalgia-like picture, even though the pain and the findings are regional. 
So this speaks again to the peripheral affecting the central, and as I will show you, the central affecting the peripheral as well. So what are the clinical signs? As we already discussed, allodynia, pinch and roll test, hyperalgesia, using a pinwheel, and we will often see overlap. And of course, with my fascial trigger points, what is so perplexing and confounding to uh, to clinicians and obviously distressing to patients is the referral patterns because the patient is focused on where their pain is and they think the pathology is there. But we as clinicians need to understand and integrate the role that trigger points play and understand and appreciate that they can refer pain some distance away. And we'll talk about that as well. So what are these trigger points? Essentially, these are discrete, palpable, hyper-irritable nodules that are formed in a, con a cluster of contraction knots within this taut band. And the current terminology is active versus latent, and that suggests a zero versus one. But what I'm going to show you, and of course active means that it's spontaneously painful, and then when you press on that trigger point, the patient says, oh, 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 yes, yes, right there. You can move your finger ever so slightly off of that active trigger point and find a latent trigger point. There's no spontaneous pain. It will also be tender, but the patient will say, no, that is not reproducing my pain. So we want to focus, of course, um, our treatments on active trigger points. And now as I, will, I will show you, there are biochemical differences, there are imaging differences, there are clinical differences between active and late, there are EMG differences, whole host of things that are, that are very objective and quantitative differences in, in, uh, uh, between the two. Um, but what I will also show you is that what uh, trigger points ex likely exist along a spectrum. So zero or one uh, assumes an all or none phenomenon, right? You either latent or active, but as we will show you, you are somewhere along a spectrum of latency as well as along a spectrum of activity uh, in terms of the trigger point. So again, this is a persistently contracted uh, knot um, in the muscle. So. Syndrome is basically a pain condition that we said may be acute, but more commonly, much more commonly, it's chronic, and it certainly involves the muscle, but also, as I'll show you, the current surrounding connective tissue, particularly the fascia. One of the clues to myofascial pain, uh, as opposed to other types, is this aching, dif deep, diffuse, and difficult to localize. And as we said, it's often referred some distance away from the trigger point. Why is it difficult to localize? This is fundamental neuroanatomy. We simply have fewer muscle afferents coming in to these neurons as compared to say skin or the joint, or, or for example. So the patient is not able to localize as well where that pain is located. Now, according to Travell and Simons, the trigger point is central to the diagnosis. However, Trigger points are commonly found in asymptomatic people. I'm sure all of you could palpate your upper trapezius right now, and you could probably find a trigger point there. And if you're not having any pain, you could press on it. It's tender, it's painful, but you're not having spontaneous pain. So by definition, that would be a latent trigger point. The challenge clinically is this, right? We often see in patients with spontaneous pain who have active trigger points, latent trigger points, and we need to discriminate and differentiate them. So the way to do that, as we said, is careful palpation and examination. There is no substitute, really. It's like playing a musical instrument. The more you practice and palpate, um, this is what I teach our residents and medical students, the more you do that and understand the function anatomy, the better you will become at differentiating these different tissue layers, the different muscle, musculature, et cetera. So, this ability to palpate and reproduce that spontaneous pain is really key to making the diagnosis. Now, some of you may be familiar with Simon's original hypothesis, which is that this syndrome was caused by some type of overload or injury to the local muscle. And as on the upper left, you can see this eccentric muscle contraction. In the lower left, you can see this abnormal sustained posture. And I'm sure during COVID, you know, many of us were probably, you know, pitched over our laptops like this for hours and hours, like, you know, you're going to be today <laughs> during this webinar. Um, and certainly repetitive movements, as you can see in the, in the young girl playing a musical instrument. So all these have been associated. And of course, some type of um, overload of the muscle, meaning um, 
um, a, a powerful active contraction, right? As you can see here, that could potentially form this uh, knot. But as I will show you, these active trigger points, regardless of how their origin, are associated with persistent nociceptive bombardment into the dorsal horn and neuron. And as I will show you in particular, it's the wide dynamic range neuron. Why is it called that? Because it receives input from skin, bone, viscera, periosteum. So this is why muscle can refer to the viscera, viscera can refer to the muscle, uh, et cetera. So that's another, we're doing lots of fascinating research on chronic pelvic pain and studying just this phenomenon. So to understand that is very helpful. So again, it's this persistent bombardment leading to central sensitization, not just in the spinal cord, but as I'll show you in higher brain centers as well, such that now even lifting a water bottle, right, is painful. Why? Because the threshold has been lowered in that muscle, right? The threshold for firing and uh, causing spontaneous pain. Okay. All right, so I wanna thank Dr. Dharmanand and uh, really it's a pleasure to have this opportunity and I've had a wonderful time in indoor, look forward to returning again uh, at future meetings. So I live here in the Eastern uh, Atlanta, uh, United States, particularly in the, actually in the Mid-Atlantic region in a city called Bethesda. Um, and if we look a little closer, we're just nine miles, 10 miles from Washington, DC, a little bit closer. And this is my office, and this is the NIH uh, Clinical Center. And of course, the Clinical Center was in the news from particularly during COVID because Dr. Fauci, Tony Fauci, who recently retired, um, was the, as I'm sure all of you know, was the director of NIAID for, for many, many years. Um, sorry to see him go. But one of the wonderful things about working in this environment is that um, we get to do what's called bench to bedside, bedside to bench research. And I'm a clinician, like I'm assuming many of you in this audience. So what are our clinical observations that we then turn to our colleagues in the basic science and say, can you help us with this? And our colleagues say, look, this is what we're observing in the laboratory. Uh, uh, what does this mean clinically, and et cetera? So what I like to tell people is that the NIH is the clinical center is like any other hospital in the world, except uh, we don't have an emergency room and we don't deliver babies. This is a research hospital and all patients slash subjects come, on, it, come in under a particular protocol. And that's how, and it's, this is a federal uh, facility. So the healthcare is completely free. It's paid for by um, our US tax dollars. Okay. So I have nothing to disclose, um, except that I'm really proud to be part of an interdisciplinary, multi-institutional, multinational collaboration of investigators. Uh, Dr. Lynn Gerber is my mentor. She hired me 30 years ago, and some of you may recognize her name. She is a brilliant clinician and researcher. She's actually triple boarded in uh, room, internal medicine, rheumatology, and PM and heart. Um, Cecily Stefano is an outstanding physical therapist who has lots of experience with chronic pain, myofascial pain, chronic pelvic pain, does ultrasound guided treatments, um, and is a fantastic uh, co-investigator. Haley Morris is a student of ours who's going off to medical school. Martin Mamora is a very well-known physiatrist um, and who's been teaching um, the spinal segmental sensitization model of chronic pain, very involved with the World Health Organization and other um, important bodies. Uh, Siddhartha Siktar is the uh, uh, engineer, um, is, an, is a, an engineer, and he is now the PI of a HEAL uh, grant, which is the uh, helping to end addiction long term. This is NIH. I'll talk about that HEAL grant. And he's also a brilliant engineer and, and all our, he is their lead investigator on all our imaging uh, uh, papers. Uh, John Serbel is the chiropractor and a neuroscientist. And um, he's the author of the Neurogenic Hypothesis for Myofascial Pain, which I'll be discussing. Antonio Stecco is a name you may be familiar with. He also spends his life in airplanes. Um, and um, he is an Italian uh, physiatrist and um, has done seminal work along with his sister, Carla, in understanding the role of fascia in myofascial pain syndrome. We affectionately uh, call ourselves, in fact, we even have t-shirts that say myofascionados on them. And on the back, we have a picture of our uh, trigger point uh, complex that we use in all our papers. So this is truly an exciting time, I believe, for um, research in this area because 
doors are opening all over the world. The investigators are, you know, in South America, in Europe, in Asia, et cetera, are really trying to delve into understanding the underlying mechanisms of uh, myofascial pain. So much so that um, Dr. Siegfried Mensa, who is the world's authority on uh, muscle pain, in fact, he co-wrote um, a textbook on um, uh, myofascial pain, understanding its uh, diagnosis, mechanisms, and treatment. He co-wrote that book 20 years ago with uh, David Simons. And um, one of the things he refers to, and I'll talk now about central sensation, I'll just refer to it as C-sense, is this concept. Trigger points are not merely a peripheral phenomenon. The input from trigger points leads to hyperexcitability of central neurons that manifest in allodynia, hyperalgesia, and pain referral. And it's because of this mechanism that we talked about, increased release of glutamate, substance P, et cetera. But number two is also very important, and particularly for every clinician on this web webinar. He emphasizes that the changes that you see on the left, the, set, the changes are based on an increase in the efficacy of connections among neurons in the central nervous system, okay? By induced by what? Persistent nociceptive input, okay? So what this is, let me translate that sentence, not show you the studies that support that. What this is saying is that the, the, more, the, the, the more bombardment you have coming from peripheral sources, the more likely you are to, particularly in muscle, more likely you are to open these, what were previously ineffective synaptic connections. And now this can lead to amplification of the receptive field of pain, allodynia, hyperalgesia, et cetera. Okay. So um, let's look at it at a little more basic level. And what you see here is a presynaptic neuron, a postsynaptic neuron, an inhibitory neuron. You can see that the postsynaptic neuron, the NMDA receptor is normally closed with magnesium. And uh, if there is just a brief noxious input, what will happen is you have a little bit of glutamate, you have a little bit of substance P, but you do not see the facilitated release, okay? And also importantly, you have release of GABA, both pre and postsynaptically, which will help to unwind or at least, you know, decrease the, the activity in this neuron, right? But what happens, this is the point that Mensa is making, uh, when you have persistent nociceptive bombardment, well, this is what will happen. You will have this co-release of substance P and glutamate such that substance P will actually form a complex with its receptor and undergoes endocytosis. So, Right off the bat, let's appreciate this is not behaving like a simple neurotransmitter, right? This is behaving almost like a hormone, if you think about it, right? So now glutamate and substance P together will do what? This is a second messenger, and it will now phosphorylate that NMDA receptor. Now calcium can rush into the cell. And as you know very well, calcium is a very powerful second uh, messenger, and this will lead to genome activation, protein synthesis, hyperexcitability, potentially toxicity in this cell. And certainly this can lead to the clinical manifestations that we often see in our patients. I wanna draw your attention to the inhibitory neuron as well, because look, this also has an NMDA receptor, which is normally closed with magnesium. In this case, what's been observed is when you release that, uh, the same phenomenon can occur, calcium can rush in, but look what can happen you could potentially undergo dysfunction and or apoptosis of these inhibitory neurons. Now imagine if you have a patient who has dysfunctional segmental inhibition. So now they're losing that balance as I'll show you in a moment of excitation inhibition segmentally. Now, whether they have pain or not will depend on what? If they've got adequate descending modulation, they may not have pain, but they could have segmental findings of allodynia, hyperalgesia. They could also, this could also be the precursor to developing a latent trigger point, which then under the right circumstances could become an active trigger point as we will discuss. Now, over time, what happens is that these um, receptors actually will recycle up back up to the neuron and look what can happen. You get the formation of additional NK1 receptors, which serves as a substrate. So again, I think this reinforces the point that Dr. Metza made about how important it is to identify and turn off these sources of persistent nociceptive bombardment. So what does it take to do that? 
It takes the co-release of the fast transmitter, which is glutamate, and the slow transmitter substance P together. And in Mensa studies, what's most effective in driving this is nociceptive activity coming from muscle. Okay, so I think this is what's really something that's powerful in terms of our understanding of the clinical manifestations related trigger points, central sensitization, segmental findings of allodynia, hyperalgesia, expansion of the receptive field of pain, uh, et cetera. How do we explain this to our patients? Well, one of the things I like to say is, think of it, well, what is a seizure disorder, right? A seizure is essentially, right, an epileptic attack is loss of inhibition. And so I explained to the patient that what we're trying to identify is where they're losing inhibition in their spinal cord, and then why are they losing it, right? What are the sources of bombardment from viscera, from joint, from muscle? Do they have inadequate descending modulation or is there some combination of both of these things? And again, as I'll show you, it affects not just the dorsal horn, but the ventral horn, the intermediate horn, and the contralateral horn as well. If I have time, I'll show that to you. So as you know, musculoskeletal pain affects a staggering 85% of the population at some point during their lives. And myofascial pain is considered to be the leading cause of musculoskeletal pain. It's the primary cause of chronic persistent regional pain, including shoulder, chronic back pain, tension type headaches, orofacial pain, et cetera. Okay, let's just look at low back pain demographics, for example. Okay, as you know, low back pain is the leading cause of disability. This is WHO statistics, is the leading cause of disability adjusted life years with an average disability prevalence of 39% globally. Just think about that. It presents significant financial burden to society with an estimated cost, direct and indirect, of $624 billion. Unfortunately, most low back pain is nonspecific. That is, it's not attributable to a known etiology, such as infection, tumor, osteoporosis, lumbar spine fracture, structural deformity, inflammatory disorder, radicular syndrome, or cotoquinus syndrome. Interestingly, similar to nonspecific low back pain, myofascial pain syndrome is also presented as a clinical conundrum and long-standing diagnostic challenge, challenge due to lack of a specific cause or structural pathology. And as you also, as you may know, low back pain is commonly associated with myofascial pain syndrome with one study reporting a 56 prevalence of trigger points in the quadratus uh, uh, lumborum of chronic nonspecific uh, low back pain uh, patients. Okay. All right. So now let me um, emphasize here, this is going to again sort of be an overview, it's kind of a view from 35,000 feet. So what happens when you palpate and identify that active trigger point, okay? Well, we have done microdialysis studies and have confirmed that these active trigger points have elevated levels of bradykinin, serotonin, which in the periphery is pro-inflammatory, pro-nociceptive, norepinephrine, elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 beta, TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-8, I'll talk about the neuropeptides in a moment, and a more acidic pH. And what Mensa and Lars Aaron Nielsen and others very elegant and seminal studies have shown is that these biochemicals individually or collectively synergistically can sensitize and activate that local nociceptive ending, sending increased bombardment to the dorsal horn. But now I'm going to introduce a very important concept, which is the role of the dorsal root ganglion, right? The dorsal root ganglion is doing what? It is releasing neuropeptides, substance P, CGRP, somatostatin, in two directions simultaneously, orthodromically towards the spinal cord, right? It's going to lead to everything we've discussed so far, which is further sensitization, upregulation of these receptors, and potentially opening of previously ineffective synaptic connections to be discussed. However, this is very important to appreciate as well. That is the antidromic release of these neuropeptides, which means down the axon, whence where they came from. Why is this so important? Because this process of neurogenic inflammation, we know occurs in myofascial pain as well, and it occurs in a number of other conditions. I'll show you neuropathic pain, um, 
visceral pain, etc. But here's the key here. So we observed elevated levels of these two neuropeptides. The only source of these biochemicals is the dorsal ganglion. So by definition, if they're elevated active trigger points, by definition, there's neurogenic inflammation occurring. Why is that important? Because it will lead to sensitization and activation of that trigger point. So more pain, more tender there. But because it's being released along a peripheral nerve, and in this case, it's the nerve innervated by, innervated by C6, C8, because this trigger point is the latissimus dorsi muscle. So lo and behold, what can happen is if you look for it, you will see allodynia, not just in the trigger point, okay, and sensitization, but also in the myotome. So if you were to examine, let's say the triceps muscle, you would see more tenderness in that muscle um, associated with this, presumably if it's only one side and on the right side than on the left side. You would also see tenderness in the dermatome associated with C6, C8 and in sclerotomal structures. So what are sclerotomes? Well, ligaments, tendons, periosteum, bursa, and theses, things that in your profession you see inflammation and pain every day, right? And so the question I believe we need to ask ourselves is, is this true local inflammation? Because if it is, it should respond to a local uh, anti-inflammatory injection. But if it doesn't respond, then we need to ask ourselves, is this finding of uh, uh, in, uh, uh, bursitis, tendonitis, et cetera, enthesitis, a sclerotomal manifestation of segmental sensitization and neurogenic inflammation. And of course, this can occur in the axial skeleton and in the peripheral skeleton as well. Any sclerotomal structures, bursa, ligaments, tendons, what have you. So unfortunately, too many clinicians will say, oh, Mrs. Jones, you have pain in your elbow or in your spine because look, you, you, have, you have these findings on x-ray or MRI. But how do we necessarily correlate those findings to the clinical symptoms, right? Because I could make the point that, well, that was there last year. They didn't have pain then. Why do they have pain now? The same finding, right? You've seen the studies where they take uh, people off the street who are completely asymptomatic, right? They do MRI studies on their back. They see degenerative changes, neuroforaminal narrowing, whole host of changes, but they're also asymptomatic. So I want us to understand, and what our group is doing is trying to move away from this medical slash anatomical model of pain and looking more at the mechanism of central sensitization, neurogenic inflammation, et cetera, and the role that trigger points could potentially play, either as a primary source of dysfunction or as a secondary. So now the other thing I want to emphasize here, because we haven't talked about it yet, is of course the brain. And what the fMRI studies have shown is that these patients with so-called local regional pain problem actually have dysfunction in their limbic system, okay? Number two, as you know, there's dynamic communication occurring in real time all the time between the supraspinal structures and the spinal cord, right? And this activity right, whether, um, and, and, and if, if there's a lack of descending modulation or there's persistent bombardment, what can occur? Well, the patient can actually start to develop mirror image pain. And this can occur in the absence of nociception on, that, on the opposite side, right? And so 30 plus years ago, when I was in my training, we were taught, well, yes, that makes sense because if they have their right shoulders hurting, they're now overusing their left shoulder, and that's why they have pain there. It could be, but it could also be due to these mechanisms having to do with communication, sensitization um, in the spinal cord. And as Mensa studies have shown, and that's what the lightning bolt is meant to sort of, you know, uh, communicate, we can see, and as I will show you, this extra segmental spread of communication up and down. So truly, this pain can start to become what we call metastatic, meaning it starts to spread. And can you imagine how stressing this is to the patient? Uh, but fortunately, as I said, um, we understand much better now the role that these trigger points can play, either as a primary source of dysfunction, right? And in now, in this case now, uh, 
not only do we examine for myofascial trigger points, but if the pain is chronic, we also will do a segmental evaluation to identify if they also have signs of allodynia, hyperalgesia segmentally, and then we can target those areas. So for instance, just imagine this is the latissimus dorsi muscle, not the upper trapezius, but you do a deactivation of that trigger point. The patient might have temporary pain relief. Why do I say temporary? Because if that active trigger point is associated with segmental sensitization, the pain is likely to recur on the trigger point. It's going to recur. And so unless you also deactivate, desensitize the sensitized segment. Now, if you desensitize the segment, that's so far, that's you, you're on the road to recovery. But what if the cause of that sensitization is coming from another structure, whether it's somatic or visceral? endometriosis, peptic ulcer disease, uh, osteoarthritis, and, and, and uh, you know, in the cervical spine, you get the picture. So this is the model, as it were, um, and uh, the, the, the direction that our research is going, both our animal model research as well as our clinical research. Okay, so um, fortunately, in some people, it's very easy to do a pinch and roll test. You don't even have to pick up the skin. Uh, to identify where the, the, the roles are. But anyway, it's not always this obvious, but when you learn to do a pinch and roll test, as I'm sure many of you already do, um, it's, it's a very easy uh, thing to identify. So one of the things I wanna emphasize here is because uh, most people, myself included, when we learned about nociceptors, we thought of them as merely these passive structures, which encode noxious stimuli, which is true. But nociceptors actually have a very key role, I learned, um, in maintaining tissue health. And that's because they initiate and then maintain the reaction to injury in an acute pain scenario. So here you see from one of Mensa's papers, um, um, the a muscle nociceptor and what he's done over the years and with others is really carefully catalog and characterize all of the different receptors on the muscle nociceptor, the biochemicals that bind, we'll talk about that in a bit. But what I wanna emphasize right here is this, is that these nociceptors are dynamic two-way structures responding not just to noxious stimulus, but this, the um, neurogenic inflammation. So the dorsal root ganglion, imagine when it's releasing those neuropeptides all the way down the axon, it's releasing it via the nociceptor into this local milieu. And that's why it's critically involved in initiating and maintaining the reaction to injury. But as I'll show you, if neurogenic inflammation keeps running like this in a vicious cycle, right? And you have loss of descending inhibition, what have you, then you're more likely to be stuck in this persist, persistent pain state. So again, these biochemicals are being released here. Why is this so important? Because it can lead to more pain, more tenderness, CGRP and substance P. CGRP will, of course, is uh, induce plasma extravasation. Substance P uh, will, uh, will lead to, you know, the formation of uh, prostaglandins and you'll get, you know, more um, uh, serotonin and platelets and all these things coming in. Essentially, this uh, inflammatory response. But neurogenic inflammation is inflammation, as you know, that occurs and can occur in the absence of tissue injury. And that's the point I want to make here is that this is not necessarily due to any tissue injury at all, especially if it's being initiated via the central nervous system as our, as our, our research and particularly John's research is showing. So where do we see neurogenic inflammation? Neuropathic pain, osteoarthritis, inflammatory pain following tissue trauma, right? Complex regional pain syndrome, what used to be called RSD, right? Again, it's this antidromic release of neuropeptides down the axon, which will lead to more tenderness in every structure um, that is innervated uh, by that uh, particular um, segment, right? We also see it in chronic visceral pain, for example, in chronic pelvic pain, in asthma, in cystitis, in irritable bowel syndrome, and in changes in both bladder and uterine contractility. So, you know, uh, again, these are the types of conditions that you as rheumatologists would be seeing, I'm assuming, in your, in your daily practice um, as well. So again, let's look at neurogenic inflammation in a little more detail and understand that if there could be some type of tissue inflammation that could be in that or an active trigger point, but it's this release of a variety of biochemicals, which will activate the nociceptor, sending increased signals, 
there's your dorsal ganglion releasing those neuropeptides and this neuropeptides will lead to this feed forward process right of now developing a sensitized nociceptor which is much more easily bombarding the dorsal horn neuron and under ordinary circumstances we've got uh, catecholamines glucocorticoids right coming out uh, descending to help quell the activity in this neuron but what happens if your patients have dysfunctional descending modulation and or dysfunctional segmental inhibition. Well, they're much more likely to develop cent uh, central sensitization, segmental findings, neurogenic inflammation, and as you can appreciate, this can persist, um, this phenomenon. So I hope I've shown you that the nociceptor is not merely a two-way, it's not really a one-way um, uh, uh, source of information. It actually communicates in two different directions. These are our two boys when they were three and five. He's now 25 and he's 27. I'm, I am the little one. Um, but you get the idea, it's this two-way communication. And that's really what's key here to understanding about um, what's happening. So, so the conundrum that we have about trigger points in myofascial pain is that they're very common, they're very complex. But what is, what's happening? They're overlooked. They're overlooked because um, of an overlooked cause of non-articular musculoskeletal pain, um, primarily because we don't fully understand the etiology and pathophysiology. We're getting there, but we're still, we're still, we still have a ways to go. Now, as I said, finding trigger points, according to Javel and Simon, is essential to the diagnosis. But let's put all our cards on the table and say, well, wait a minute. If they're so critical, why are they so commonly found in asymptomatic people? And then what is the significance of, as I said before, finding latent trigger points very close to active trigger points? And as you will see, this has a lot to do um, uh, uh, with the uh, central sensitization and uh, neurogenic inflammation. So if this patient came into your office, right, um, complaining of back pain, right, um, some people might say, well, look, those muscles look so healthy. They could possibly be a, a source of, my, of myofascial pain. I'll be back. But remember, whether the muscles are healthy looking or not so healthy looking, we should, we should always keep trigger points within our differential diagnosis. That's all. I think that's the most important because, you know, if we don't do it, no one's going to do it. I mean, that's the key here. Um, um, it's really important because you, you see this in your clinical practice. And how do you do that? Again, um, being able to palpate and identify. And when we did our workshop in indoor, myself and Dr. Dharmanand and Prane and others who helped with the workshop, um, we were showing people how to palpate, how to identify, how to uh, treat these with needling, et cetera, um, how to identify the sensitized segments. So one of the treatments that used is uh, dry needling. And this is using a simple acupuncture needle, as you can see here. And the, uh, my colleague here is using his left hand to localize that, that hyper-irritable nodule. And then with the acupuncture needle, see what he's doing? It's almost like a pistoning. Actually, look, look there, the twitch response. He's trying to elicit that local twitch response in the muscle. And I don't have, won't have time to show it to you, but we have demonstrated using sonolastrography that when you do dry needling and it's successful at reducing pain, it actually reduces the size of the trigger point. It increases the pain pressure threshold. It improves range of motion. Okay, so again, the studies have shown that dry needling is very effective and also that we're, under, we're starting to understand more about how it works. And of course, there's also the role to play for trigger point injections and the utilization of specific pharmacotherapeutic um, agents, depending on um, the, the target that you're identifying. One of the advantages, though, I think you'll agree, um, that if you're going to needle, and if it's just for needling, you want to use an acupuncture needle, because compared to, let's say, your 25-gauge syringe, which is beveled-edged, right, that is going to damage tissue irritate C fibers, it's going to increase neurogenic inflammation. So rather than use a uh, beveled edge needle, we simply use these rounded tipped uh, acupuncture needles to deactivate these trigger points and to desensitize uh, by treating the medial branch of the posterior primary rami, as I showed you earlier, um, the associated sensitized segment. And studies, including John's and others, have shown that dry needling reduces 
trigger point uh, uh, sensitivity. John Serval is my uh, colleague that I mentioned. So what are some of the benefits of dry needling and these desensitization techniques? Well, it can confirm a clinical diagnosis by relieving or limiting a patient's pain or by uh, eliminating or uh, relieving symptoms of nerve entrapment. Um, it can rapidly in, in, in eliminate pain in an acute pain condition. So if you have a patient that has an acute myofascial pain, uh, they really don't have much sensitization. You go in and you can see here, this is a, a treatment of the uh, um, uh, uh, opponents. And I think the first dorsal interosseous, uh, this is a colleague of ours, Jan Dommerholt. Um, uh, inactivation of trigger points can relax the taut band for hours or days. And most importantly for any physical therapist, uh, uh, this is that it can help facilitate other therapeutic approaches, including physical therapy, self-stretching, right? Um, that's really important. And then taut bands that have not been released rapidly through manual therapy may be released by dry needling, saving time, lessening patient discomfort, and really also decreasing long-term strain and stress and strain on a therapist's hands who may be utilizing manual treatments uh, to uh, deactivate to these trigger points. Now, I want to put this question out there because I may or may not have time to answer it, um, depending on um, um, how much, how, how, I thought the lecture was one and a half hours and I'm going to correct me said it's only an hour. So that's why I say that, but you will see, you know, I'm happy to come back another time. So that's this question, which is really perplexing. Why are trigger points so commonly observed in the number of musculoskeletal and non-musculoskeletal pain syndromes in the absence of injury to the affected muscle? And you see these things every day in your clinical practice, these somatic, neurologic, and visceral conditions. I'm not going to read the whole list. Just to say that the, what I highlighted in, vis, in yellow under visceral is chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which we have been studying in, in great detail um, in patients with and without endometriosis and seeing that they have a huge burden of active trigger points and they have sensitized segments in the absence of muscle injury. And as we, we've shown, even in the absence of endometriosis, the endometriosis has been treated. And according to the gynecologist, the patient shouldn't have pain. Why? Because they got rid of the lesions using hormones and surgery. And I've actually had patients say to me, uh, Dr. Shaw, I was told by my gynecologist that I shouldn't have pain. And I said, well, you do have pain. Let's try to understand why you have pain, right? Because the gynecologist was thinking from the perspective anatomically, structurally, says, look, this pain is caused by these lesions. I take out, I treat these lesions, the pain should go away not understanding that those lesions can cause central sensitization, neurogenic inflammation, and can elaborate myofascial trigger points and pelvic floor muscles and abdominal muscles, et cetera, right? Even after you treat them. And that's quite aside from everything else that can happen to activate trigger points in the pelvic floor, a um, whole host of conditions as you, as you well know. Okay, just to something that I put that out there for you to think about. Okay, something else to think about. Look at this. So it's very interesting that um, when um, that the association between herpes zoster and myofascial pain, and they've shown that treatment of the primary pathology, the herpes zoster infection with antibiotics led to long-term resolution of the trigger points, okay, along the, the segments associated with it, suggesting a causal relationship between the underlying infection infectious pathology, and trigger point expression. So this could be another manifestation, as it were, of this sensitization and neurogenic inflammation. Something to think about. Um, and again, it starts to move us away. I hope you that you've convinced, I've convinced you of this simple, uh, or, oh, I shouldn't say simple, but the original uh, muscle overuse or local injury model of, of, of Simon's hypothesis, which still has a lot of value. I don't, I'm not trying to um, poo-poo it at all. In fact, I'll show you that if I have time. But this is the fundamental question. Is the active trigger point the primary pathology in the pain syndrome, or is it a secondary physical sign? Is it the chicken or the egg? If it's the chicken, right, and you treat those trigger points, you should be fine. The patient should be fine. But if it is the egg, if it is secondary, you can treat it as long as you want or as often as you want, but it's going to keep recurring. And that is because this question, 
and uh, that, that you need to ask yourself, is chronic myofascial pain caused exclusively by dysfunction of the muscle and or myofascial tissues? And the key word there is exclusively. And the answer, as I'll show you, is no. It's not exclusive to dysfunction in muscle. Okay. So again, going back to Mensa's seminal work, he has shown that no matter where one complains of pain, neck, shoulder, back, knee, what have you, ultimately, the expression of that pain is based on the balance of sensitizing and desensitizing actions in red and green in the spinal cord. So the sensitizing action, as you can see, is due to the um, uh, bombardment coming in from the nociceptor. The desensitizing is green, right? And coming from inhibitory neurons and from the counterreceptors. And he's showing that once a neuron is sensitized, it will demonstrate these three critically important phenomena. One is increased response to external stimuli, which is basically saying allodynia, hyperalgesia, fine. Number two, when I learned this, it's like eureka, light bulbs started going off. And I hope you have the same feeling based upon what you observe in your clinical practice. And that is the extra segmental spread of excitation to segments that are not receiving input from the injured muscle or from the muscle that is the source of the bombardment. This is the extra, the concept of extra segmental spread, which is very important to understand and which can, as I said, lead to not just diagnostic confusion, but uh, unnecessarily and potentially harmful procedures and treatments and patient unnecessary uh, patient suffering when all we had to do in many respects uh, cases was to try to identify if they had active trigger points, segmental sensitization, et cetera. So our job, I believe, is to identify those sources that are causing more excitation, right? Identify, deactivate them. And then we can do that by doing what? By increasing activity in inhibitory systems. And part of that is clearly through physical medicine modalities, because what we do is, right, is to activate, uh, and that's physical medicine, physical therapy, uh, mechanoreceptors, right, to help compete with the excitation, in addition to identifying, as I said, the source. But here is the concept that I'd like you to think about here, based again upon very fundamental neuroscience that we understand. So that is that these sensitized dorsal horn neurons demonstrate extra segmental spread. So that's what this is showing here, right? So let's say you have a trigger point in your quadratus lumborum muscle, which is innervated by T12 to L4, right? And that trigger point is a source of bombardment into that dorsal horn. But we know that there is this extra segmental spread, as you can see here. So imagine, and before we talk about that, and again, we, we'll see neurogenic inflammation, we'll see increased release, uh, more tenderness in that myotome, dermatome, et cetera, as well. But I'm just, right now, I just want to talk about the concept of extra segmental spread. Why? Because the patient could also develop an active trigger point in their iliopsoas muscle. Now, let's say that the clinician is focused more on the iliopsoas, but not on the quadratus lumborum. And so they think, they're assuming that the iliopsoas is primary, you see? So if you treat that trigger point, it's likely to recur because in this particular scenario, the trigger point in the iliopsoas is coming from or is being sensitized by activity from a quadratus lumbar. Now, this is a simple somatosomatic, right? Um, activation. Imagine if this was visceral somatic, right? This could be colon, this could be esophagus, this could be endometrial tissue, what have you. And you could see the same relationship primarily because of the wide dynamic range of neuron, which I won't have time to go into. But as you can see here, persistent bombardment, this extra segmental spread, and then communication both ipsilaterally and contralaterally in the spinal cord. And um, this can occur, as I said, both ipsilaterally and contralaterally. So what you see here is a patient uh, that I just showed you with the iliopsoas trigger point, right? And is it primary or secondary? And in this case, it was secondary. It was secondary to the trigger point in the Next, quadratus lumborum muscle, quadrature. okay? Which you can see right here. Right? So again, yes, these the muscles are agonists, the right? They're, they're co agonists. They they're in together and function together, overlapping functions. But we as clinicians need to distinguish which muscles of the upper are primary, which are secondary, right? 
uh, in certain... terms of the myofascial dysfunction. So quadratus lumborum, sending bombardment in, right? And you see this extra segmental spread as we discussed. Now, what I'm showing you here is merely a simple, as I said, somatosomatic. And number two, this is in a otherwise, in this scenario, a pristine spinal cord, meaning no loss of inhibition. But imagine if this patient had segmental loss of inhibition previously because of cholecystitis, because of a peptic ulcer disease, what have you. So now those segments can now be more easily turned on and activated, and the patient can start to express through CSENs and neurogenic inflammation, myofascial pain and trigger points potentially in those areas. So if we're mindful of that uh, and understand um, as you, as rheumatologists, take a, such a thorough history of your patients to understand all the conditions that they've had. Now, please consider the segments that those conditions, even though they're, they're maybe remote history, they're not currently um, uh, present, they're, they're successfully treated, but they may have caused sensitization. And that's why the patient may start to uh, express uh, manifest pain in those areas. So, and as I said, I won't have time to talk about it, but we can see this mirror image uh, pain developing as well, um, both sides. So um, I don't know how many of you have, uh, speak Portuguese or have been to Portugal, but um, in, uh, uh, in Portuguese, uh, it's Dor and Espelo. That's how I've been to Portugal many times. And every time I go, someone always asks me this question. Are you related to uh, our prime minister? Juan Antonio Costa, and so some of you who know, he's actually um, has some Indian heritage. Um, so um, and now, now that this image is burned in your brain, um, but anyway, you get the idea that there's this um, uh, mirror image uh, pain uh, that 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 can occur uh, from one side to the other. Okay, so what I want to do is show you one thing, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead to kind of give you this uh, overview slide um, in terms of. Mensa studies. So let's say you have whatever the cause is, trigger point, injury, osteoarthritis, endometriosis, what have you, it doesn't matter. There's a pain experience. There's catastrophizing, right? The patient develops negative affectivity potentially, right? And then they perceive this as a sort of threatening illness information, right? They develop pain-related fear, which you will often see, right? And they start to avoid activities, which normally even that give them pleasure. They develop disuse, depression, disability, right? And now they go into this vicious cycle, as you can see here. And, um, and this can persist even after the original source of bombardment has been successfully treated. That's why, as I said earlier, that uh, patients who've had chronic pelvic pain have said, the gynecologists have told them, you shouldn't have pain because they treated the endometriosis. They have a clean bill of health viscerally, but they're still having pain. Why? Because they're sensitized. Okay, and so what we utilize and what we teach uh, is the importance of identifying these sensitized segments, desensitizing them, um, and then trying to restore normal thresholds. And in the very first office visit, yes, uh, when you deactivate a trigger point, when you desensitize a segment, you can show the patient, look, you can improve your range of motion. You can do that activity now with either no pain or less pain. So that helps them to confront their pain, decrease their fear, improve their function, improve self-efficacy, and get them on the road to recovery. And I believe one of the advantages of doing these office-based treatments, these simple physical medicine modalities, is that it also will enhance our recommendations, whether it's in the realm of diet or exercise, lifestyle changes, um, because and, and medications, because the patient will have more faith in us as a clinician if we improve their pain in the very first office visit. I mean, that's pure psychology, right? So coming in, your patient sees themselves as this, right? In the chronic pain clinic, we want to transform them into this, right? Um, you know, have this sense of, you know, uh, uh, domain over their lives and uh, re reassert their control because they've lost control for so long. Okay, so let me just skip ahead. And we just go out of this and just thank you for your patience. If I want to get to um, Mensa studies here, and I didn't get a chance to show you the fMRI studies and our clinical studies showing that, um, yes, again, that these patients have limbic system dysfunction, 
and they actually have decreased activity uh, in their contralateral dorsal hippocampus, which is the part of the brain involved in decreasing your, um, uh, uh, helping you modulate stress. And we've done clinical studies that have shown, yes, these patients have more distress, more fear, et cetera. And, and all they have is an acute local myofascial dysfunction, nothing else. Okay. So uh, again, this is not fibromyalgia at all. I want to reassure you of that. Um, these are patients who simply have um, a local but chronic myofascial syndrome in the upper trapezius. That's where we've done all of our studies. Okay. And here we go. Okay. So just please indulge me. So I want to share this with you because it kind of gives you the big picture. So I'm going to go uh, for another five, seven minutes. Um, what are the spinal mechanisms underlying expansion of the receptive field of pain? So Mensa, and oh, let me just go past this. this is, I talked about this before, but just real quick, this is that wide dynamic range neuron we talked about earlier. And the reason this is so important is because 60% of these neurons are in lamina five, and lamina five is one of the lamina that's preferentially activated by muscle bombardment. So it's simple neuroanatomy that the muscle can influence the viscera and the visceral can influence the muscle. And that's why you see this in your clinical practice. Okay, so let me set this up. So this was a study that was done by Mensa's group. And what they did was to look at um, uh, and measure the activity in a neuron that is excited exclusively by noxious activity within this circumscribed area of the biceps femoris muscle. So that's what this red connection is meant to show you here. This is an open, uh, effective connection. What did they do in this experiment? Well, they injected bradykinin into the tibialis anterior here, and what did they observe? Five minutes after injecting here, this neuron, which previously only responded to noxious pressure within this very circumscribed area, can now respond to noxious stimuli here and even here. So how is this happening? So what Mensa discovered is this. We have so-called effective connections between neurons, and this is the original neuron I showed you for the biceps from Morris uh, and its receptive field, and the neuron for the um, TBLS anterior and its receptive field. And we have so-called latent or ineffective connections, which can be opened up under the right circumstance. What's the right circumstance? Persistent no susceptible bombardment. In this case, just an injection of bradykinin into the tibialis anterior, because what will that do? What we've already talked about, it will cause that facilitated release of glutamate and substance P, phosphorylated and NMDA receptor, et cetera. So, but what he showed was this. So look here, you see these, this, what was, this is an ineffective connection between this neuron of the tibialis anterior and this neuron of the biceps femoris. And under these circumstances, now this neuron, uh, that uh, uh, synapse can suddenly be activated and opened. So now look what can happen. This neuron can now respond to noxious stimuli in the TBS interior. But even more interestingly, and as I'll show you clinically significantly, is this. The original receptive field of the vices from Morris, look at the pink color, that's meant to signify that it now responds to even knock innocuous stimuli like light touch. Okay, so this is the precursor for developing allodynia, hyperalgesia, and expansion of the receptive field of pain. And so Mensa makes the point that you could have two structures, such as the sacroiliac joint and the Achilles tendon, which are very far apart structurally, right? But the neurons, right, that control those two areas can potentially communicate amongst themselves such that you can open up synapses where they previously were closed. So let me show you this clinical example and then we'll be done. So let's say, and this is Mensa extrapolating his studies now into the realm of what has been observed in myofascial pain syndrome. So let's say you have a patient who first develops pain in their lower leg, as you can see here, Achilles gastroxoleus, Achilles tendon, the heel. And then they develop pain in the sacroiliac joint, okay? So this is the sequence. And of course, we want to rule out radiculopathy, side joint dysfunction, et cetera. You rule those out. You open the trigger point manual and you say, look, there is a trigger point that refers pain in both these areas, the gastroxoleus, Achilles tendon, and in the sacroiliac joint. So what could be happening here? 
So again, I don't have time to go into all of this, uh, everything. I, I, I apologize. I thought it was an hour and a half lecture. Um, but anyway, so what you see here is what I'm showing you is the neurons for L5S1, right? For the gastroxoleus. I'm showing them in red. Why? Because there is spontaneous pain in this region here, right? And the neurons for the sacroiliac joint I'm showing in purple initially because there's no spontaneous pain yet. And this, these are the so-called latent or ineffective connections. Now, remember, you've got this active trigger point in this patient in the gastroxoleus bombarding the neurons for L5S1, right? Now, when it does that, it will release those neuropeptides and that can cause these previously ineffective synapses to open up and become effective ones. And now lo and behold, look what can happen. The patient can start to develop pain in their sacroiliac joint in the absence of any local nociception or joint dysfunction in that area whatsoever. Okay, so this now opens the door, I believe, we believe, our group believes, is trying to understand the underlying mechanisms of some of these bizarre pain patterns that we see in our clinical practice day in, day out. Now, imagine if you did a trigger point deactivation, and again, this is not, let's say you, you treated the gastroxoleus, you did a trigger point injection, you did electrical stimulation, manual therapy, it doesn't matter, whatever it was, and you deactivate that trigger point. Can you all appreciate now that the pain here in the sacroiliac joint will likely not go away because look, they're already sensitized. And how will you know that? You just do a simple pinch and roll test and you will see that the findings remain. When you treat the segment, those findings will go away as we demonstrated last year on indoor. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. You're going to say, Jay, well, if it can affect S2, S3, can it affect L3, L4? Of course, I just didn't have time to cover that. But the question, the answer is yes. So now what structure could be potentially unmasked as a source of pain? The knee joint, right? Now the patient may already have uh, some findings in the knee joint, osteoarthritis, what have you, right? And so unfortunately, many clinicians will then assume that the pain is necessarily coming from that local osteoarthritic changes that are in that joint. It may be playing a, playing a factor, but I hope you can all appreciate that it's just as possible under this scenario that sudden increase in pain felt in the knee joint could be due to extra segmental spread and excitation, in this case of L3, L4. And it could also go to the opposite side. And of course, it could affect the hip joint as well. Okay, again, segmentally looking at this um, what are the different structures that could be affected? Now, if the patient already has findings there based on imaging, et cetera, let's not presume immediately that it's only due to that. It could also be due to, it could be sensitization as well, and it could also spread to the opposite side, okay? So this is a simple somatosomatic. And just the last thing I'll mention is that we've done studies, as I've shown, looking at the viscerosomatic. So in patients who have underlying endometriosis, we see these segmental findings even after the endometriosis is gone and these findings can persist, okay? And that's why we certainly need to treat the segments. So this is the question that you please ask yourself when you see myofascial pain. Um, is the trigger point the primary pathology? Um, is it the cause or effect? So thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for going over. Let me just go out, okay. Okay. Thank you very you. much, uh, Dr. Jesha. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, we all have understood the complexity of uh, pain and the pain mechanisms from his slides. And I, I wish we had more time to listen to him probably some other day and uh, we can have a, another talk. And now I uh, request um, Dr. Raman Sharma to uh, look for any questions from the audience and uh, Dr. Jay would be uh, happy to address that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You can come out of, uh, you can stop sh sharing the screen. Stop share. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. So that you, yeah. can, you can be seen better. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank Great. you, Shah, for uh, a very exciting talk on uh, an area which kind of is 
is never really taught and uh, most of us would have it was an eye opener for the for most of us who listen to you and uh, there are plenty of questions uh, the first question which is there is that uh, uh, does dry needling have same effect uh, in patients who are depressed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the patients who are not depressed mm, interesting question so does dry needling have well uh, what i can say is this is that um, in our studies where we've used uh, self-reports, profile of mood states, SF36, et cetera, um, we've shown uh, improvement in mood now, but these were not clinically depressed patients. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah but I'm just saying that in, in the patients who have chronic myofascial pain, they do have depressed mood. And so we do see improvement in that just by relieving their pain or some association between that, yes. And the other question is, does deep tissue massage therapy work for trigger points? I think some of that yes. you elaborated during your presentation, but still- Yes, so it does, yes, deep, te deep tissue work does help, but here's the caveat. And um, so Jan Dommerholt, um, who's a good friend of mine and who's a Dutch trained uh, uh, physiotherapist, and will say this, he will say it works in certain circumstances, but we also know there are many patients who cannot tolerate it because of, I hope I throw you now, because they're sensitized. So he will make the argument, as I think I showed in one of those slides, that by simply almost surgically, I'll use that in friends, surgically using your needle to deactivate the most active trigger points, you can, as we have studies have shown, you can so almost like reset thresholds. So now the patient can tolerate deep tissue massage, much, much better. Another thing I will say, Dr. Sharma, this is just based on anecdotal clinical experience, and that is working with our physios like Cecily, is that when you desensitize the segment, right, you treat the segments associated with the pain, and we can do that using electrical stimulation, very simple. Um, what we see is that the patient now tolerates the manual treatment much more easily. And we can measure through using algometers, right? Uh, improvement in their pain threshold immediately after desensitization. So that facilitates the manual work. So it's more comfortable, it's more comfortable and more tolerated by the patient. And ultimately from a mechanism standpoint, it's really trying to understand the peripheral and segmental relationship. But that was a great question. Thank you. Yeah, another question which a couple of people have asked is, uh, can nerve conduction studies differentiate between the myofascial trigger points versus the uh, inflammation? Or is it just the uh, acute examination, as you were saying? I mean, yes, can any yes, of that... the physiological test help in, in differentiating between the two? Yeah, so great question. Nerve conduction per se, no. Um, we are doing, and this is part of our grant, some um, muscle impedance, bioelectric impedance studies, which are showing some interesting results. Like I'll just leave it at that. We're still in the, the discovery phase here. But what we're hoping is that we may be able to come up with a more simple diagnostic test that will help us um, localize these points um, and maybe even show us where... Uh, where that, that neurogenic inflammation is more likely occurring. Um, but I want to emphasize to your audience, um, and, and I know Dr. Dharmanan feels very strongly as I do about this, as does Prem Kumar and others, that these are very um, uh, office-based assessments and techniques. I, while I gave a lot of information related to mechanisms and all that stuff, the science, but the, the fundamental clinical principles are fairly easy to learn. And I believe in the workshops that we teach, I always emphasize, you can start doing this on Monday in your clinic, but absolutely. Um, and you can see, and I've had patients, I mean, I've had clinicians email me and write me saying that they're, that they, now that they're looking for this, they've been able to show that where a patient is sensitized, what happens when they treat or deactivate, whether it's the joint or the trigger point or the viscera, and then how does that change sensitization? How does that change um, the myofascial pain if the myofascial pain is secondary or primary? So I, I, did, I, I went beyond answering your question. I apologize, but I didn't want that message to be lost. And Dr. Darmanan, if you want to add anything, please do to that statement. Yes, um, uh, thank you. Uh, being rheumatologist and medical, we all uh, go by medical model. 
Uh, and if I, I also went through the questions, people were asking, is there any test I can do to uh, look for central sensitization? Is there any test we can identify uh, which cytokine is more in the muscle and the trigger points? I think it is still not, we are not there and it's right. still very manual. And mm -hmm. if I yep. can, uh, I mean, if, I mean, correct me, Dr. J, if I have understood um, uh, it not correctly. If somebody comes to us with a knee pain and it, the x-rays and your clinical examination tells us that he has osteoarthritis mm -hmm. uh, and you have given them an intraarticular steroid mm -hmm. and the patient's pain doesn't come down, the patient right. has the pain. Of course, we, are, we look for trigger points in and around the knees. Yes. And what Dr. Jay Shah is telling us is also look for uh, central sensitization, look for the... Uh, Segment, the segmental, yeah, yes. At the L2, yes. L3, L4 level. Oh, yeah. Look for you any skin roll, uh, just roll your skin, uh, your, um, some kind of a sharp, not so sharp, but blunt uh, instrument along the spine. If there is an yep. area of increased sensitization, mm -hmm. probably giving a local anesthetic injection or a dry needling, that area also might improve yes. the pain. Yes, am exactly. I, am I right? If I've understood That's correctly. exactly right. That's exactly right. But then let's take it one step further, which I think maybe you're about to say, but what if that segmental sensitization is coming from another structure, yes, a visceral or somatic. And so their, their knee pain, even though it makes perfect sense what you said, and my training is the same as everyone else's there, that we were taught that local pathology, you see the symptom, the findings, you treat, it should get better. But what happens if it doesn't? That's So we have to keep going back and back. Um, yes, it's almost like layers of an onion. So yeah. I think so that's every step getting. you try to... Uh, treat the step one. If they don't respond, look for the above level. Then start looking mm -hmm. for any any from whether the pain is coming from anywhere else. Yes. You see, whether it's a secondary uh, manifestation of a primary problems yes. occurring in some other viscera. Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah. You got Amal, it. Amal, Amal, sir, yeah. please. And I think we'll take another four or five questions and stop probably. Okay. Oh, you're muted, Dr. Sharma. I'm sorry. I think, can you hear me? There is one yes. patient specific question that post herpetic neuralgia following COVID vaccination, especially in the area of left lower and middle abdominal area. So mm -hmm. this in, so is there any, it's not responding to anything. So any specific mm -hmm. suggestion? So I would say, I would say the most important thing right away to do is to examine, do, are they segmentally sensitized? Number one, and treat that segmental sensitization. So as Dr. Dharmana was saying, it's the medial branch of the posterior primary rami. Um, those are, and then in the video you saw with the local anesthetic, when you introduce the needle, you could actually, you know, orient it up as well as somewhat down. So you can treat a few segments at a time. Or like he said, we can also use um, acupuncture needles, et cetera, to try to desensitize the segment. Um, that's, one thing I would try first immediately just to see. And then like he said, is there something else underlying in this patient's case? Do they have any other somatic and visceral pain or conditions that now in the setting of herpes zoster has basically put another straw that has broken the camel's back, so to speak. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think another question is, is this metabolic syndrome linked to myofascial pain syndrome? So uh, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody know? Does anybody? I don't know. Right. So there are other things where people have asked whether there is like I think there is some confusion regarding considering myofascial pain syndromes also having uh, associations just like fibromyalgia has. Mm -hmm. So whether there is increased inflammatory IBS or inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. more commonly in yeah. In, Myofascial yeah. pain. Well, that, I, I, yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. But here's the thing I want to also emphasize, and this is like I said, my colleague John Serbel, and I would encourage you to read some of his papers, S R B E L Y, um, who's the neuroscientist. I did get a chance to talk about his neurogenic hypothesis, but essentially it says that ultimately it doesn't matter where the primary pathology is in the sense that, but if it's in the same neuromeric field, right? then potentially you can elaborate uh, myofascial pain and other things in structures that share that segmental innervation. So I believe, Dr. Sharma, in many ways, this is almost like going back to what we did in our original training, which is being really good diagnosticians, 
right? Fundamentally, that's what it's about, you know. And um, it's just now we're starting to much better utilize the neuroscience uh, to do that. So in patients with metabolic syndrome, presumably, you know, there, there's so many changes going on, which could make them more susceptible to developing anything along that spectrum from a myofascial pain syndrome, which is less sensitized to more sensitized. And then, like you said, developing a more widespread, but you, you know, very well, the studies that have shown that even in patients with fibromyalgia, they have a huge myofascial burden, right? Myofascial trigger point burden. You treat that, you can alleviate their pain. I would add, in addition to treating that, we should also look for segmental findings um, because I have a, my senses because I've seen many patients who have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia when they really don't have that. They just happen to have, you know, more than one region, myofascial pain syndrome, and they've then been lumped in this category. And then, you know, they don't they not get the adequate treatment they should get. I think some, of the question, some of the questions are uh, also on the same lines. What, the first question is, how do we address the multiple segment by needling for different areas of... Oh, adaptation? great question. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm glad that you asked that question, Dr. Sharma. Fantastic question. <laughs> what I did get a chance to share with you, and this is fascinating, everybody, is that just like Mensa's work has shown that you could have an extra segmental sensitization, what uh, we observe, again, this is clinically, anecdotally, is that when you see segmental findings, what we teach and what we practice is we want to identify that segment that has the lowest threshold, okay? Because that presumably is ground zero of the earthquake, so to speak. And then when we treat that segment first, we often will see extra segmental desensitization as opposed to if we only went segment by segment. So you can save time and you can actually be more effective, I think, by simply targeting the most sensitized segment that's associated with that particular pain uh, that they have. So, because again, we see extra segmental sensitization clearly um, in, in his uh, studies, but we also can see by careful needling or electrical stimulation, et cetera, an extra segmental desensitization as well. However, having said that, yes, you could certainly put, simply put acupuncture needles. I mean, in these, any of your group uh, who do acupuncture, I've done acupuncture trained in that, will recognize that some of these locations are classic um, acupuncture points. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that the, uh, the original discovery of this, they utilized, you know, uh, meridians and, and chi and energy and concepts that was contemporary then. Now we're just using uh, contemporary language now, which is scientific, which is desensitization. So I think there's some interesting overlap there between acupuncture and dry needling and all this stuff. Yeah, but great, great question. Thank you. The other question is, what is the duration of dry needling and what are the recurrence rates of these pains? So how long would the effect last? Yes. And for how so, frequently will this be needed to be done again? Yes, so that ultimately depends on what I said at the very end. Is the trigger point primary or secondary? If the trigger point is primary, you deactivate the trigger point, you get the patient into physical therapy, you know, make sure they're they're taught self-stretching, they you teach them proper ergonomics, their workstation, if we're talking about upper extremity, neck, shoulder symptoms, what have you, right? So you teach, we try to teach the patient how to keep their muscles functional, limber, et cetera. However, if the, and so one treatment often is sufficient, but I will say this as well. Sometimes the patient is most focused on what is bothering them at that first office visit and you deactivate that. And then either at that time or the next time they come back, they say, you know, by the way, <laughs> I have this pain here. I have this pain there. Uh, once they recognize that you're looking for something very different, which is now myofascial and you treat it successfully, they'll say, you know, that feels a lot better. I wonder if that's, is that what I'm having over here, over there? So your patients will come back to you again with other, with perhaps other aches and pains that may be segmented related or that might not be. So, um, so that's what I would say in terms of, you know, duration. Um, but if it's secondary, you have to treat the segment and, or then find out what is causing the sensitization. Otherwise, you, just doing local treatment will not be successful in my experience and others as well. Yeah. Thank you. 
So another question is, does injection of xylocaine or steroids augment the dry needling? So can you? Uh, I, 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 I haven't done that, so I don't know. Dr. Dharmanan, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, we have see before we were using um, dry needling. We were using mm -hmm. um, local anesthesia injections. I don't inject steroid into a trigger point, mm -hmm. um, but it can give immediate relief mm -hmm. for somebody who has an acute, uh, painful event. Somebody coming with a dry neck, with severe mm -hmm. trigger point elevator scapula, giving an injection that can make them better, mm -hmm. and probably they will require further uh, physio and maybe a uh, few more uh, dry needling right. sessions. Yeah. But it can help. So, yeah, no, I think and you said something important. naturally to us because we are used yes. to injecting something. So as a rheumatologist, yes, we can yes. probably go and quickly inject. But but I have a question though about the steroids. So you said you don't do that. And I think, uh, yeah, I want to ask you, you because I, yeah, yeah, you don't. And can you explain why? Because that's important as well in terms of uh, muscle, right? When we, all the while we thought that there was not much of inflammation, steroid can cause local uh, damage to the muscles, atrophy. Right. So yeah. we never thought steroid, I mean, even the studies where they have used steroids, yeah. there was no, no real benefit of steroid over dry needling versus injecting only uh, local anesthetic. So we have right. stopped using uh, steroid unless there is an inflammatory bursitis or a yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think I think an analogy would be is like to say instead of using a fly swatter, you're using a bazooka. <laughs> right? I mean it's kind of overkill, but I think that's what you yeah, yeah. Too much. I think okay. although you might have you have already clarified, but still there are a couple of questions still typed in. So mm. I would wish to you to address those. Because more than one people have asked it. How do we clinically decide that a particular painful tender point is an extra segmental extension and not a primary pain generator? Or mm -hmm. in the example that you gave, when there is an illosauce pain, when do you conclude that it is generated by a primary at quadratus lumborum and not just myofascial tender point at psoas? Yeah, yeah. My fashion, we, I would, I would, I would be careful when we we say trigger point, not tender point. Trigger points are tender, but the the tender point of fibromyalgia that's just nomenclature, right? So yeah. um, it has it. Ultimately, it comes down to um, what happens when you identify something that you think is primary, and it does not respond to local treatment. Um, then, um, if you and, and, and I, what I would, I would add to what we would have said earlier is in, in the example of the knee joint pain, I would do a segmental exam initially, um, not, not later. I would do it initially just to see if that knee pain is also correlated with se segmental CSENs, because if it is, it's very possible that unless it's a very acute problem, that it's going to recur um, and it may not respond to the to the local injection of that of that joint, so um, it, it it comes down to taking a good history of the patient. I've seen that many many times, Doctor Sharma, where the patient will sometimes say, "Oh yes, I remember. You know, I had a uh, gallbladder surgery, or I had this problem." And what we I want to emphasize to you to the person people who are asking that question is remember. It's not it, people, everyone's spinal cord has their unique um, genotype and phenotype, right? So everyone has their own uh, history of insults, of expression. And even if they're not having any current or if they're having a, a, a somatic or visceral condition that is well managed, it can still cause sensitization at those levels. And so that makes it easier than to unmask, as it were, the uh, a pain problem. Th does that make sense? And so that's where doing a segmental exam as part of your assessment initially before you do any other tre any treatment can be very valuable. Why? Because when you do that treatment, see if the segmental changes improve. Because if they do, then you know that that, that was a, a source of Bombardment. That doesn't mean that was the only thing. There may be other sources there uh, that are primary and or secondary that could be facilitating the problem. But I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much. I think with this, I'll hand over to the president, sir, for any last minute questions or concluding the session. I think we are uh, half an hour past our uh, <laughs>
And uh, I, I, my sincere thanks to Dr. Shah for stimulating an interest uh, in this field and also opening our eyes to the concept of um, regional sensitization and sensitization, central sensitization and its role in um, initiating and perpetuating uh, chronic pain syndromes. And uh, this is take this, we might not have understood everything of uh, uh, what is being told today because it, it is a relatively new concept for many, many of us. Mm -hmm. And take this as a stimulation to learn more and attend more lectures and um, read a little bit more about this. And you will, you can easily understand this. And uh, yes. we can, at the end of the day, our patients are helped. What I will do, Dr. Darmanad, I will send you some of the papers uh, that I think might ha help inform more if people have more questions and et cetera. So that might be wonderful, helpful to wonderful. our, our, our publication. Yeah. Yes. And uh, anyone, any one of you who is listening and uh, who is, are interested to learn more, Dr. Shah has already sent me a few papers uh, in uh, when after we met in Indoor. And whatever right. he says, I'm happy to pass it on. So oh, yes, that you, I've already sent it to you. Yes, please, please do that. Yeah, and I, I want to thank your audience for their excellent questions. I mean, this is this is why we do what we do. And uh, it's always wonderful to collaborate and work with um, um, specialists who share my interest in the subject matter. So I, I look forward to meeting again physically with you and getting together and, and doing more courses and workshops together. Wonderful. We, we shall. So um, me and uh, Dr. Raman Sharma are happy to- Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Session, and uh, thank you to Dr. Jisha. And thank you all of you for attending this meeting. Thank you very much and good night. Okay, thank good night. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.